At Leonardo DRS, we take pride in ensuring our forces own the edge by providing them our most advanced technology. As expert integrators, innovators, and trusted advisors, we meet the immediate needs of warfighters in the field while envisioning force modernization solutions of tomorrow. With our experience and real-world ingenuity, warfighters have the solutions they need to deliver a thoughtful and forceful response to evolving threats, so they own the edge. Learn more at leonardodrs.com slash own the edge. All right, good afternoon. Welcome to the 149th Annual Meeting of the U.S. Naval Institute and to our members and supporters here with us and our members who are joining us virtually. We're very glad to see so many here. I'm Pete Daly, CEO and publisher, and I ask everyone, now that we've just asked you to sit down, to stand up and say the Pledge of Allegiance. The Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We'd like to thank our sponsor, Leonardo DRS, for helping make this event possible. Uh, for most of our events, we don't charge admission, and we do this with the generous support of individual and corporate sponsors, so we thank them. It's now my honor to introduce our board chair. Secretary Bob Work was the 32nd Deputy Secretary of Defense, serving under three different secretaries in two administrations. He also served as the Under Secretary of the Navy from 2009 to 2013. Currently, he's president of Teamwork LLC. He's a senior counsel for defense Counselor for Defense at the Center for New American Security and the Telemus Group. He's a senior fellow at Johns Hopkins APL and is a principal at West Exec, West Exec Advisors, also an independent director for Raytheon. He's also served as the co-chair of the National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence. He was commissioned as a second lieutenant in the Marine Corps through the NROTC program at the University of Illinois in 1974. During his 27-year military career, he held a wide range of command, leadership, and management positions. He's been a member of the Naval Institute since back when he was in Illini in 1974, and he served as the chairman of our board, the chair of our board, since 2019. Let's welcome the Honorable Bob Work. Well, it's a beautiful day in Annapolis, and it's great to see you all here today. Chairman Daly, members of the U.S. Naval Institute Foundation, members of the U.S. Naval Institute Board, members of the Institute, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's so great to be here. This is the first annual meeting we've ever had in the Jack C. Taylor Conference Center, this spectacular venue. Uh, you know, this was built through COVID. And it's on time, on budget. In fact, it's totally paid for. And it is going to be the centerpiece of the Institute in terms of bringing people together and discussing hard issues uh, for the next century. Um, you know, this really gives us a home field advantage uh, in being able, I think when people see this, it's going to become a center for war gaming. I think a lot of people inside the Beltway, once they find out about this place, will swarm here. So it's just good to be here for the first uh, annual meeting, for the 149th annual meeting. Now, you all know the Naval Institute is an open, independent, nonpartisan forum for discussion about the Naval services. Uh, I've been a member of the Institute since I was a second lieutenant in 1974. Uh, it's just, in my view, one of the finest um, magazines, the proceedings. Uh, if you've been following the American Sea Power Project, which uh, was 
inaugurated last year. Uh, there have just been a slew of articles that talk about uh, how important naval power is to the United States of America. Look, we are in a p unprecedented time. Enormous changes in the international security environment. We're in the midst of an I mean, a technological tsunami. This is exactly the time when there are military technical revolutions and we change the way we think about the character of war and we change the way we organize and we change the way we fight. <coughs> And one of the best ways to think about that is in an open forum like the U.S. Naval Institute, uh, which thinks about these knotty problems and gives the leaders of the naval services a lot to think about. You know, more than 75% of all our articles are from active duty practitioners. They're the greatest strength of the Institute. <coughs> so... With all the advanced technological challenges like uh, artificial intelligence, quantum computing, 5G, additive manufacturing, synthetic biology, the way the Navy is organized and will fight is changing today and will continue to change. And so uh, I couldn't be prouder to be the chairman of the U.S. Naval Institute Board. And I want to welcome you all here this afternoon. Thank you so much for coming. I hope you've had a chance to look through this uh, just eye-watering facility, and I look forward to the meeting. So thank you again. Go Navy. Beat Army. Okay. <laughs>
Three generations of Winnefelds have been essay winners, and he will be missed. We also say farewell to Lieutenant James Barksdale and Captain Scott Smith, who each served a year on the board. Thank you. And we also thank Major General Tracy King, who has served as our liaison. We have three active duty liaisons who support us um, in our board of directors deliberations. And he represented, obviously, the United States Marine Corps. Thank you. The editorial board is vital to the credibility of the open forum. All the members are active duty. They all work above and beyond in their primary jobs, their day jobs in the Navy, Marine Corps, and Coast Guard. Their active duty perspective provides an invaluable view and course guidance for proceedings. We could sit here and think we remember the halcyon days of our time served, but we really depend on those practitioners who are serving today. Newly elected to the Ed Board are Lieutenant Commander Michelle Foster, Captain Tom Clarity, Commander Devere Crooks, Sergeant Major Anthony Easton, Lieutenant Andrea Howard, Major Brian Kerr, Lieutenant Commander Tyson Metters, Commander Scott Wells, and Lieutenant Colonel Adam Yang. Congratulations to them all. Special thanks to our departing members, Captain James Carolland, Captain Scott Smith, Lieutenant Colonel Will Stanky, and Captain Josh Taylor. Special shout out to Scott Smith for his leadership on the Ed Board during a challenging year. Many members of the Ed Toyo Board are here. I hope you can meet them. And they're here with us tonight in person, and several are also joining us online, virtually. We thank our terrific Naval Institute Foundation trustees for volunteering their time and their steadfast support for the Institute. They always had our back and supported our efforts no matter what came at us. And the comprehensive campaign results speak loudly about their incredible impact. Special thanks go to General Pete Pace for his leadership during an extraordinary and impactful time in the period of the Naval Institute Foundation's history and the U.S. Naval Institute history overall. I'd also like to point out, before I go to this press slide, that uh, we're very proud that we did the whole comprehensive campaign in-house. We didn't give it to a, a third party. We didn't sick people on our members who they didn't know and very proud that our staff, our very small three, four people, foundation staff, did the heavy lift that they did. And I'd like to do a special shout out for Heather Lancaster and her team uh, for a fantastic effort. <laughs> Founded in 1898, our Naval Institute Press annually publishes nearly 100 titles. That includes the foreign imprints. Uh, the Naval Institute's press offerings span the arc from the past to the current to the future. And we're tapping into new markets with new readers with our Naval History Special Editions in an effort to promote and preserve Naval history. Blending the past with the present expands our reach into previously untapped territory. We're doing partnerships with YouTube creators, which has spurred renewed interest in classic titles like Ward Carroll's Hunks Trilogy and bolstered our popularity with new books like Paul Stillwell's Battleship Commander and creators like Drakenefell, Ward Carroll, The Battleship New Jersey and Military Aviation are working in association with the press to promote a variety of new titles. We're excited by these and the new opportunities to promote our authors and our books. The American Sea Power Project started and Chair Work mentioned this but started in 2021 in January, and it continues the Naval Institute's long legacy of thought leadership related to naval power. From time to time, the global security environment alliances and technology shift significantly enough that we need to do some re-examination. And we believe we're at one of those junctures now. We need a debate, not just for the professionals in the Navy, the Marine Corps, and the Coast Guard, uh, but also for national political leaders and the American public itself. They need to understand fully the vital contribution of sea power to our security. Jerry Roncolato and Paul Giara provided the key stimulus for this effort, and I'm very proud of what they've done 
I'm very proud of Bill Hamlet and his periodicals team uh, for their terrific work delivering on this. Uh, the project just entered phase two. We started with looking at the ends of strategy, and now we're looking at the ways, and we will get to the means. Um, CNO told me just the other day, I was chatting with him after an interview that we did, a maritime security dialogue, and without prompting, he said, I really like that American Sea Power series. And uh, so that I took that as a, an endorsement. He also likes our podcasts. Over the past six years, our online page views have nearly tripled, and we've continued to grow our total audience and reach in 2021. We had gains across USNI News, the blog, and then the whole usni.org website. And it's exciting to see who our readers really are. And it used to be we had to fall back on the demographics of our membership, but now, due to more modern methods and, and analytic tools, we could really see uh, the age dispersion of who our actual readers are, and the age group dispersion is super healthy. Of course, uh, most of our audience is domestic, but we've seen since 2021 a double-digit growth in international readers, uh, which are up more than 20% in uh, Europe and Asia compared to 2020. USNI News saw traffic growth for the ninth straight year. Um, in 2021, the site saw 21 and a half million page views, an average of about 1.8 million views per month, which is a 7% increase over our record-breaking traffic um, from the year before. USNI News has grown into the most trusted U.S. Naval News site domestically with a full-time staff of three FTEs and almost a dozen international freelancers and other contributors. And it's now the, the news journal of record in the D.C. flag wardroom as well as providing uh, critical service to the American public. Many of our gains last year came from authoritative, story, authoritative stories on the Bonhomme Richard fire, the USS Connecticut, uh, which had a collision with an uncharted seamount. In November, USNI News reported a secret target range in China with targets shaped like US aircraft carriers. They're based on satellite photos, um, commercial imagery, Maxar. And these stories sparked hundreds of international headlines. And 2022 is already shaping up to be a great year. Just in the first three months of 22, we've increased by 15% our USNI news traffic, and we're averaging over 2 million a month right now. More and more, it's the source of source for major news platforms. So with over, let's talk about social media for a minute. With over 560,000 followers on Facebook and 108,000 on Twitter, the Naval Institute has the largest social media presence among all professional military membership organizations. Reach is defined as the total number of unique individuals who viewed our content posted on social media platforms. And the Naval Institute's reaching weekly 4.5 million people on Facebook and 700,000 on Twitter. Naval Institute's social media, again, is followed by hundreds of reporters from other news outlets. It's a little nerdy, but average engagement rates measure how frequently people comment or share a social media post. And those average rates are 0.06% for Twitter and 0.27% for Facebook. Anything over 1% is kind of considered very good. And the Naval Institute engagement rate is 4.26% for Twitter and 6.78% for Facebook, indicating that our audience is finding our content compelling. Impressions measure the total audience for all news stories that cite the Naval Institute. And our, and our posts, again, frequently become a source for bigger outlets. In the month of April alone, the Naval Institute was cited by CNN, ABC, the New York Times, the Washington Post, National Public Radio, USA Today, and dozens of other outlets. The broad exposure helps fulfill our mission to advance understanding of sea power and other issues critical to global security. So where does the content go? Uh, the international coverage is shown in dark blue on this chart, and the Naval Institute's grown into being this global source with hundreds of international outlets citing us in dozens of languages, 
while linking to our content. And it improves our web search engine rankings, which increase the chance even more people will be able to find us and our content online. I note, too, that this year, a record 32 foreign Navy chiefs contributed to our international Navy's issue, which is double the number that we had six years ago. At the end of 2021, we concluded the Naval Institute's first ever campaign, as I mentioned. The comprehensive part is key. Comprehensive paid for the capital project of the Jack C. Taylor Conference Center, in which we sit here today. Uh, but it also included the regular funding for all the annual mission critical program requirements uh, for the Institute. And we're grateful to all the members, donors, and foundations and corporations that made this annual investment in the Institute. And while we celebrate our campaign success, we still need annual philanthropic investment to continue our work. So this philanthropic support is how we fund our mission critical programs, several of which are not self-funding. Without annual support, these programs wouldn't be possible. Essay contests, we don't just produce three winning authors. We also bring in new writers. And as Chair Work said, 75%, in some cases up to 85%, are active duty practitioners. This is how we find our new talent. This is how we fund USNI News, which is provided at no cost. Conferences and events, such as today's meeting, are funded through this process. And our world-class oral history program, which we took over from Columbia University in 1969, captures 30 to 40 hours of discussion between a professional naval historian and a key naval figure. And we must do more to capture that primary source history before it's lost. So what's our philosophy about fundraising? We believe in delivering now. We don't have an endow or pile up a mountain of cash philosophy for later. We, we identify a specific philanthropic target, we raise money, and we deliver near term. And that's been the secret to our success. We strive to deliver content that compels donor support in their lifetime. We transition back to in-person events last summer in 2021, um, and moving forward, our big lesson learned, which is no uh, flash traffic, no Z in front of the state time group for this audience, is that uh, you know we're, we're gonna be living with hybrid events for many years because we can do this live stream tonight, we have our in-person audience, but we also can improve our reach and get Q's and A's live from a remote audience. And then we see ourselves doing that moving forward. DARE is a two-day workshop that brings together 65 mid-grade military and civilians to develop solutions to answer challenge questions that are posed by the service chiefs. And DARE 2021 was our first in-person event since the pandemic. We did it in August last year, and, uh, before we even cut the ribbon, and it was our first, it was our first event. We executed the big two-day grand opening event in late September to celebrate the new center. And it was mostly with the donors and supporters who contributed. But it's been great to see the follow-on activity. And uh, addition, I need to mention that we've started 2022 strong with conferences. And this West 2022 conference that we do with our partner, AFSIA, out in San Diego, uh, the excitement was palpable. And we had over 8,500 attendees over three days. Uh, it was big. So now that the Jack C. Taylor Center is complete, we're bringing new events to the venue. Uh, we just uh, partnered with the Naval Academy. Well, we partner annually with the Naval Academy on an applied history conference. And uh, we're gonna host the 2022 version of that conference, 25 October here at the Jack C. Taylor Center. And this year's theme will address the Russia-China partnership and its potential impact to world order, which we think is especially timely. And we also, and it's pictured, it's pictured uh, here. We have also started our Warfighter series. Uh, we bring in plebes, we fill every seat on Friday nights. We start with a pizza bribe, but then, <laughs> but then we bring in 400 plebes. We do have a rule, no pepperonis in the auditorium. But, uh, but we bring in 400 plebes to hear a fleet warfighter on Friday nights, and it's been a 
been a big success. So this is a, an illustrative, illustrative list of some of the other groups that have used our space. I get this question a lot. It's like, are you getting outside groups? Are you, you know, having customers? And uh, I thought it was significant that, for instance, you know, I'll just highlight a couple. We got the Annapolis Film Festival, and it was a great coming out for the local community with its associated event marketing efforts. And we just did the McCain Conference, which is a prominent annual conference hosted by the Stockdale Center for Ethical Leadership right here at the U.S. Naval Academy. The due date conference was attended by Naval Academy faculty, staff, midshipmen, and guests. And the theme of their conference, which picks up on, it riffs on something that Chair Work mentioned, the ethics of military AI. And it's exactly what the Jack C. Taylor Conference Center should be doing. It was, these are the types of professional events, having the face-to-face -face conversations that will fuel intellectual debate and discussion, not only for the Institute, but for others. The auditorium and the meeting rooms were built with the intent of hosting larger meetings, um, which can accommodate breakouts. Uh, the auditorium and the meeting rooms were designed uh, to hold classified events on a per-use waiver basis, hence the doors. And we receive uh, two to three new inquiries per week. So this concludes my CEO update on the Naval Institute. And um, I'm ready for any questions if people want to come down and, and come to the mic and, uh, or else uh, send us something on annual meeting at usni.org. Thank you. Okay. Well, I think we do not have a taker at the mic, so we will continue will continue on. All right, so the Naval Institute is very proud to recognize our award-winning authors. And our essay contests date back to the very earliest parts of the history of the Naval Institute almost 150 years ago. And we'll now recognize the winners of the 2021 Midshipmen and Cadet Essay Contest, Leadership Essay Contest, the General Prize Essay Contest, and Authors of the Year for Proceedings, Naval History, and the Naval Institute Press. And I'll now turn it over to Bill Hamlet, who's our EVP for periodicals and editor-in-chief of proceedings to kick off our award presentations. Over to you, Bill. All right, great to see so many of you here tonight. Uh, I get the best part of the evening because I get to announce the names of uh, so many award winners. As Pete mentioned, uh, the Naval Institute's been running essay contests since 1879. We currently have about 12 annually. They run the gamut from the Coast Guard and Marine Corps essay contest to the General Prize essay contest, midshipmen and cadet. A great deal of proceedings content comes from our essay contest because not only do we publish the top three prize winners, but we also assess every essay that comes to us for whether we should publish it or not. And probably 30% or so of what you see in proceedings every month comes from an essay contest Pete often likes to say we, we act like our essay contests are the buffalo. We use every piece of them. Um, it's also important to note that our essay contests are judged in the blind. We don't know. There's one person on my staff who knows the identity of both the essay and the author. The rest of us who evaluate them and our editorial board when they judge them, they don't know who the, the author is uh, as we are judging the quality of the essays. And we like it that way. It makes our essay contest a true meritocracy. Uh, may the best ideas and the best writing win. The first contest winners to be recognized tonight are from the Midshipmen and Cadets Essay Contest, which is open to anyone in a commissioning program for the Navy, the Marine Corps, the Coast Guard, and the Merchant Marine, including the service academies, NROTC, and Officer Candidate School. This year's third prize winner is Cadet First Class Logan Tobias, U.S. Coast Guard, for his article, The Schoolhouse Always Wins, which offers insightful advice for changes to training and education at the Coast Guard Academy. And Cadet Tobias is joining us virtually tonight. Logan, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. I, I wish I was able to join you in person, uh, but I'm immensely grateful uh, to, be present, to be present today virtually. So, so thank you for that opportunity. My essay 
the schoolhouse always wins, refocusing the Coast Guard Academy's priorities, identifies and offers actionable solutions to what I believe is a skewed focus on academics over military training at the United States Coast Guard Academy, which is leading to the unintended consequence of the Coast Guard lacking officers who want to go afloat, which is an issue that has been looked at in previous proceedings articles. My argument, while primarily informed by my cadet experience, is that formal policies, such as the current cadet ranking system and military training calendar, graduate ensigns less operationally competent than their, than their potential. I believe it is breeding a culture where cadets learn that your calculus test is more important than your navigation brief, and early grad school or shore assignments are the paths of high performers. But mind you, in times of crisis, World War II, Vietnam, our services junior officers quickly assumed command of small boats and operated with technical and professional competence established in their military training. The current practicum in the ways I detail in my essay graduates officers uninspired to answer that call to see, call to action during the next flashpoint in the great power competition. As far as impact goes, I hope that my viewpoint as a future officer is considered as the Coast Guard Academy continues its long history of refining its process of building leaders of character. But more than anything, I want to encourage others to take a critical solution-oriented look at how we are training our leaders and preparing them for the threats of tomorrow. Every single professor and military leader at the academy is focused on serving America, but there are different opinions on the how. I greatly appreciate the independent forum offered in proceedings that enables everyone to put forward their ideas and propose solutions. And I strongly believe it is important for all military members, even green soon to be ensigns like me to write. If my essay even slightly influences the leadership development program of the world's greatest Coast Guard Academy, that is more than I could ever hope for. And, and thank you so much for your time today and for considering my essay uh, for this contest. Sir, that is the future. We love you all. Second prize in this contest this year went to Midshipman First Class Matthew Martin, U.S. Navy, for his essay, building midshipmen to rebuild a culture about how the COVID lockdown of 2020 and 2021 impacted the Naval Academy and how midshipmen have had to adapt and rebuild the culture of the brigade. Unfortunately, Midshipman Martin was not able to join us tonight. First prize in the Midshipmen and Cadets Essay Contest goes to Midshipman First Class Robert Hatfield III, United States Navy, for his essay, Commerce Warfare Capabilities as an Act of Deterrence. This essay will be in the June issue of Proceedings. My staff and I have been working with Midshipman Hatfield this past week on it. And it demonstrates that Midshipman Hatfield has been paying close attention to the writings of Mahan, Corbett, and more recently, Nick Lambert. Please welcome to the stage, Midshipman Hatfield. Thank you everybody here so much. I'd like to say a special thank you to the Naval Institute for pushing uh, young naval officers to really try to think deeply about our profession. I think that's something that we lose sight of a good bit is the profession that we're actually going into in spite of all the school and everything. Uh, special thanks to my friends and family to include my first OSTS skipper, Paul Giara, for encouraging me so much to write for this, um, as well as the whole Naval Academy History Department. Um, particularly Commander Armstrong and the many others who have influenced me along the way there that really did kind of, I would not think the way I do about the naval service that we have if it was not for that history department and those classes that I got to take there and those people I've gotten to meet. Um, my first history writing partner happens to be my fiance with me here today, so I'm especially thankful to that department. Um, but yeah, my essay in short is just one midshipman's interpretation of how I think we could possibly stay away from a Chinese-American conflict. It's talked so much about uh, how we're going to fight one day, and it's, it's preached as almost gospel nowadays, and I think we have other options besides just letting that be prophecy. All right. Thank you, sir. The second group of essay contests we're going to recognize today are those who won the Leadership Essay Contest, sponsored by the late Dr. Jack London. 
Third prize in this contest goes to Lieutenant Commander Brian Harrington, U.S. Navy, for his essay, Trust Starts on the Deck Plates, which is coming in the June proceedings. And Lieutenant Commander Harrington joins us virtually. Good evening, and thank you for the opportunity to publish my essay and be a part of this event. In 2010, I had the unique opportunity as a surface warfare officer to deploy to Iraq with Riverine Squadron 1. My experiences in that environment have shaped my approach to being an officer, and now after returning to sea from my department tours and having time to reflect, I believe there are some things that are worth sharing with my fellow junior officers. In an age of great power competition, where a great deal of dialogue surrounds the next big thing, be it hypersonics, AI, or next generation platforms, we cannot lose sight of the human element in warfare and its fundamental importance to our role as leaders. I hope this essay can provide some useful insight into that realm. This is not the first essay I've submitted to proceedings, although it is the first one to go to print. I find that writing helps me organize my thoughts, whether it's going to be published somewhere or, like in most cases, for my eyes only. I'd like to thank my shipmates for allowing me to be part of a successful team, and I thank you all for the opportunity to share my thoughts. Second prize in the leadership essay contest was won by Lieutenant Commander Courtney Callahan, U.S. Navy, for her essay, Eliminate Toxic Leadership, which could be found in the May issue of Proceedings. Unfortunately, Lieutenant Commander Callahan could not be with us this evening. Now, before I announce the first prize winner, I'd like to ask Dr. Jennifer London to join me on stage. Dr. London's late husband, Jack London, a Naval Academy graduate, former board member of the Naval Institute, and his company, CACI, supported this contest for many years now, and we cannot thank them enough. First prize in the leadership essay contest went to Major Brian Kerg, United States Marine Corps, for his essay, Leading Through Defeat, which appeared in the April proceedings. This is not the first time Major Kirk has appeared on this stage. In January, he gave a superb talk about being a Marine Corps officer to an audience of 400 Naval Academy midshipmen right here as part of our Warfighter series. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Major Brian Kirk. So first of all, I'd like to offer my sincerest thanks to the United States Naval Institute for providing a forum for discussing topics like this, to the sponsors of this award to include the late Dr. Uh, J. Philip London and his family for sponsoring this year's leadership essay contest. So why this essay? Ultimately, it was a product of grappling with my own feelings about how the war in Afghanistan ended and my responsibility as a professional naval officer. The U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan elicited visceral reactions from all of us particularly those of us who served in that country and endured what every service member endures in war. It made us wonder if our sacrifices were worth it and if our brothers and sisters in arms who'd given the ultimate sacrifice had done so in vain. And despite offering blood, sweat, treasure, and tears, we found ourselves once again ending a war in what history will likely call a defeat. The passion this elicits is real. It is possible and very human to succumb to doubt, anger, and fear and to lash out loudly in search of catharsis. But such a reaction is a resignation of our duties as leaders, it is harmful to public discourse, and it sets a poor example to those we lead. This is not the way. As leaders, we are obligated to take these very real, authentic, and sometimes agonizing feelings and turn them into something productive that can serve those we lead and inspire them to meaningful action. This essay aims to do just that. It does so by encouraging us to keep faith with our fellow service members to keep faith with our allies and partners, and to keep faith with the next generation by learning from the past. It is my sincerest hope that this essay serves as at least one example on how to productively channel our experiences into authentic reflection and proper discourse. Thank you very much.
Now it's my pleasure to introduce the winners of the 2021 General Prize Essay Contest. Since 1879, this contest has been our flagship contest. The list of past winners reads like a who's who of famous naval leaders and famous naval thought leaders. Then Commander Alfred Thayer Mahan took honorable mention in this contest in its first year. So think about that for a second. Proceedings, Alfred Thayer Mahan, honorable mention, not first prize. Other winners over the years include notable sea service leaders, many writing before they achieved their highest rank and fame. Rear Admiral Stephen B. Luce, Lieutenant Ernest J. King, Lieutenant Ned Beach, Lieutenant Commander and later Senator Sam Stratton, Captain Wayne Hughes, Lieutenant Commander James Stavridis, Commander Sandy Winnefeld, and Rear Admiral Jerry Holland are just a few of the notable winners of this contest. The General Prize Essay Contest is funded by Andrew and Barbara Taylor. We thank them for their proud and consistent sponsorship of this grandfather of all of our contests. So I'd like to just a round of applause for the Taylors. This year we received 135 submissions to this contest, a record number in the six years I've been on the staff and I suspect a record number of all time. All three of these winning essays are thought-provoking and bear directly on the challenges facing today's sea services, and they will appear in the June issue of Proceedings. This year's third place winner is Captain Sam Tangretti, United States Navy retired. Sam has been writing for Proceedings for decades, and he won second prize in this contest in 2001. He is the Lidos Chair of Future Warfare Studies at the Naval War College. His essay is titled, Keep War Confined to the Seas. Sam will receive a medal and a check for $2,000. He is already a life member of the Naval Institute, and he pre-recorded his remarks last week. Hi, I'm Sam Tangretti, and I would like to thank each of you for your support for the U.S. Naval Institute not just because you're supporting the Institute, but because your support in the Institute is critical to defining the future of the Department of the Navy and our nation. Since the establishment of the Naval Institute, not a single idea, not a single one, adopted by the Department of the Navy was not first identified, discussed, debated, refined within the pages of our journal proceedings. Sometimes this discussion within proceedings occurs years before the idea actually enters the general defense debate. Your support is critical for defining the future. I argue that the Naval Institute is more efficient and effective in generating these ideas than even the official organizations established to perform such a function. Even my own Naval War College does not do it as effective as the Naval Institute. Why? Because it is an open forum. It allows for discussion from all those interested in national security, ranging from admirals and often discussing official policies to junior officers, often describing ways of operating that are different than official policies, to enlisted who are contributing their professionalism, to civil servants who are also contributing their professionalism, to interested citizens who want a nation that is secure. It does this consistently as it has done it for many years, and it does it because of your support. Also, thank you for the support for my own writing. Uh, I am honored for to accept this award. Uh, the article in, will be coming out in the June issue, and I urge you all to read it. Basically, it's a critique of why if we do involve ourselves in a conflict with the People's Republic of China, we have to be careful about striking targets within Chinese mainland. It's also a critique of the concept of inter integrated deterrence that's now becoming part of the national defense strategy. There are other great ideas that are just waiting for publication and they will be into the forum because of your support. So thank you very much. And I'm always interested in collaborating with any of you to work on these ideas. Thank you, and I wish you a good meeting.
This year's second place winner is Lieutenant Commander Brian Hayes, United States Navy Reserve, retired. His article, The Myth of Maritime Counterinsurgency, is the latest salvo in a debate that has been in the pages of proceedings since Hunter Steyer's 2019 prize-winning essay, The South China Sea Needs a Coin Toss. Brian's essay is exceptionally well-written and argued, but spoiler alert, it will not be the last article we publish on this topic as the July issue will see the kickoff of a maritime counterinsurgency project. So Brian, you'll have lots more ideas and articles to argue against in the coming months. Brian receives a medal, a check for $3,000, and a one-year extension to his membership in the Naval Institute. Ladies and gentlemen, Lieutenant Commander Brian Hayes. As a life member of the Naval Institute and someone who has read and enjoyed proceedings for nearly 25 years, I've always considered the general prize to be the highest honor for an author in our profession. I'm honored to be recognized with this year's second prize, and I'm extremely grateful to Andrew and Barbara Taylor for their generosity in supporting this essay contest. Uh, my wife, Dr. Tara Burke, could not be here with me tonight due to a work commitment. However, I'm glad to have here my father-in-law Edward Brady of the U.S. Naval Academy class of 1963. Uh, although Ed chose to serve in the United States Army, he has maintained a lifelong interest in the sea services, and he was a friend of the late Captain Wayne Hughes, who received an honorable mention in this contest in 1981. I can't think of more elite company than writers like Captain Hughes for an author in our profession, and I'm extremely proud to join the list of General Prize honorees. Thank you. The first place winner of this year's General Prize Essay Contest actually proves my point about judging in the blind, and you'll, you'll recognize that in a second. Um, the article is called Don't Buy Warships Yet, and it's a provocative argument that plays very well in the ongoing discussions about great power competition, force structure, and procurement strategies. The winner is First Lieutenant David Allman, Alabama Air National Guard. Lieutenant Allman receives a gold medal, a check for $6,000, and a one-year membership of the Naval Institute. Lieutenant Allman, please join me on the stage. Thank you, Bill. It's great to be here. I want to express my thanks to the editorial staff at the Institute, the distinguished guests in the crowd, and perhaps most importantly, my mom, who's able to be in attendance tonight. Uh, it's a wonderful honor to be selected as winner of the general prize. Uh, fundamentally, my essay is about time. It's about uh, what, in my opinion, we can and can't do now, and what I think we must do now to in, or in order to ensure we can compete effectively in the future. There's a growing consensus that although we might be in a long-term strategic competition with China, this decade represents the period of maximum danger. To put it bluntly, we simply cannot, due to uh, budget constraints, force structure requirements, and political willpower, build enough traditional warships to solve all of our problems. Instead, I believe we need to focus on being able to deliver the maximum number of weapons possible to reduce risk this decade. This means investing in quantities of precision-guided munitions and the platforms necessary to deliver them. Simultaneously, we need to invest in our maritime infrastructure to ensure that we can build the fleet we need in the 2030s and beyond in order to compete globally. While well, I look forward to the discussion that this paper generates and look forward to discussing it with many of you all here afterwards, I wanted to use this time to ask something of you. My fellow company grade and junior officers, and in fact the midshipmen here on the yard, are the pool from which the strategists and service chiefs of the, service chiefs of the 2030s and 2040s will be selected. We're engrossed in learning our tactical craft, 
getting underway, surviving to the merge, taking the hill. But for many of us, we have a deep and abiding interest in how our tactical efforts uh, have operational level impact and ultimately strategic success. You all can help. This room has hundreds of years of experience in defense issues and maritime operations in particular. I've been very fortunate in my life to have benefited from the advice, wisdom, and reading recommendations of numerous mentors, but not everyone is so lucky. I ask of you to think of that midshipman or 01 today and think how you can assist them in their learning journey to ensure we have the brain power needed to compete over the next several decades. Together, we can ensure that the armed forces are prepared not only physically and tactically, but intellectually to prevail in peace and, if necessary, in war. Thank you. Well said. Now it's my honor to introduce the 2021 Proceedings Author of the Year. You've already met him. He's Major Brian Kerg, United States Marine Corps. It would have been hard to read Proceedings last year and not see an outstanding article or commentary by Major Kerg. He was prolific. He took second prize in the Naval Intelligence Essay Contest, second prize in the Marine Corps Essay Contest. He co-authored a professional note on the information environment he wrote a number of insightful commentaries. In addition, Brian was a finalist for Author of the Year in 2020 based on a similar output of impressive work. And we are incredibly pleased to welcome him to our editorial board. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause, please, for the 2021 Proceedings Author of the Year, Major Brian Kerb. Professional writing is one of the most effective and far-reaching ways that military members can lead. I've been fortunate to find resources and mentors who helped me cultivate my own writing ability over my career. I've been additionally lucky in finding leaders who inspired me to take the leap and submit my work for publication. I'm deeply grateful that we have, in the form of the Naval Institute, an organization that dares us to read, think, speak, and write. The Naval Institute does not exist by accident and it is carried forward by the committed efforts of people who care deeply about our profession and the security of our nation. I sincerely hope that my own contributions continue to help develop the sea services, our service members, and perhaps inspire others to offer their own contributions as we struggle with the riddles of war that must be solved to safeguard our nation and our interests. Thank you. Okay, now I get to pinch hit for the editor-in-chief of Naval History Magazine, Eric Mills. Eric is recovering from bionic man surgery right now. He'll be back in the office better, stronger, faster than before in a couple weeks. Uh, but in the meantime, I get to introduce the Naval History Author of the Year. Through the years, Naval History Magazine has benefited greatly from being able to present works by many of the top names in the field. And today we are pleased to recognize just such a distinguished contributor as our 2021 Naval History Author of the Year. That is Dr. John Prados. Dr. Prados is a senior analyst at the National Security Archive and the author of more than 20 acclaimed books related to intelligence and military history. One of the most famous of his works, Combined Fleet Decoded, was named a notable Naval Book of the Year by the U.S. Naval Institute in 1995, and his Valley of Decision, The Siege of Quezon, which he co-authored, co was named a Naval, Naval Institute Notable Naval Book of the Year in 1991. Dr. Prados has been a frequent and valued contributor to naval history for many years. His article, The Navy's Biggest Betrayal, which appeared in June 2010, remains one of the magazine's most top-viewed articles online of all time. But today we honor for him for a pair of standout features that appeared in 2021. His first, Intel Assignment Tokyo, published last June, took readers to pre-World War II Japan, where US Navy officers were gathering vital intelligence 
on the ambitious Japanese warship building program and the growing threat that would soon manifest itself at a place called Pearl Harbor. Dr. Prados returned to our pages in December with Pearl Harbor at 80, a thought-provoking 80th anniversary retrospective on the evolving perceptions of the 7 December attack. The lively feedback and discussion generated by this article proved just how enduring a subject this is and how, for many, history really does matter. Naturally, that's something we are always glad to see. In addition to naval history, Dr. Prados's articles and reviews have appeared in Scientific American, Vanity Fair, Journal of East-West Studies, The Washington Post, The Boston Globe, The New York Times, The Los Angeles Times, The Journal of American History, and elsewhere. We are gratified to be able to stand alongside these many noteworthy publications in being a venue for Dr. Prados's prodigious talents and historical insights. And so without further ado, we proudly present the 2021 Naval History Author of the Year, John Prados. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, Secretary Lehman, Director Wirth, Admiral Daly, Mr. Hamlet. I'm very happy to be with you. I'm honored to appear today. This is a distinguished assembly. I never expected to be here. And it was a complete surprise to learn that I had been singled out. It's a pleasure to receive Naval History's Author of the Year Award. Thank you very much. In the past, I had written for both proceedings and for Naval History, quite a lot in all. And the Institute had published two of my books, both of the ones that uh, uh, Mr. Hamlet mentioned. Uh, but I was not thinking of any of that. Rather, I was thinking about annual commemorations of the Pearl Harbor tragedy and how each year in succession, there seemed to be fewer and fewer veterans of the events present, while the disputes over what happened at Pearl Harbor, and who was responsible for those things, continued to rage. Um, the point has been reached that there are only a handful of veterans of Pearl Harbor to appear each year. I thought we should do something to help mark the 80th anniversary because coming up to the events, I suspected there would be less and less uh, uh, attention paid to the events. Thinking over the subject, it occurred to me that after all of these years, even decades, the same controversies about the attack remain unsettled. So I tried to illuminate them through the device of reviewing recent historical revelations and writings about the day of infamy. I hope I have succeeded in that endeavor. Thank you very much for this award. It's a pleasure to be with you here. Thank you, Dr. Prados. I will now be followed by the director of the Naval Institute Press, Adam Kane, for the presentation of the Press Author of the Year. Thank you, Bill, and thank you, everybody, for attending tonight. It's wonderful to see so many faces live and in person. Uh, as the director of the press, it's my pleasure to announce the Naval Institute Press Author of the Year, an award that is annually given to the author whose book shapes our understanding of naval history, our maritime or military past, or a national security-related topic. Uh, the 2022 Author of the Year is Paul Stilwell for his book, Battleship Commander, The Life of Admiral Willis A. Lee, this biography of Lee chronicles his naval experience, uh, both as an officer and individual who helped shape the Navy uh, and ships that he would later command, particularly when he was placed in command of Task Force 64, uh, and, American -led naval, or, and led American naval forces to victory in a tide-turning battle near Guadalcanal in November of 1942. Paul himself has deep connections to the Navy and to the Naval Institute. A retired naval officer, he has long been one of the Navy's foremost historians and a friend to many, 
who championed the preservation of our naval history. He is also a prior award winner. Uh, he was recognized in 1993 for his book, Golden 13. Congratulations tonight, Paul, on being recognized as our author of the year once again for your terrific biography of Willis A. Lee. Paul? It is a thrill to be here. Thank you. I am most grateful for this award because I have such high regard for the Naval Institute and what it does. I will add parenthetically that 60 years ago yesterday, I raised my hand and enlisted as a seaman recruit in the U.S. Naval Reserve. That At the time, I thought the Navy would just be something to get through before I went on with the rest of my life. Little did I dream that the Navy would become the rest of my life, and I am so grateful for that. This is a wonderful anniversary gift. I was inspired by serving in the crew of the battleship New Jersey in 1969, the year I joined the Naval Institute. And while there, I learned of this great Admiral, Willis A. Lee, who had had his flag in the same ship 25 years earlier. So sort of shipmates with some distance in between. But he was largely unknown, uh, except to a few historical specialists. His life was almost waiting to be revealed. And so I started the research, and it took 45 years to get it done, but worth waiting for, I hope. Producing this book has been a team effort. At the press, I salute acquisitions editor Glenn Griffith, who was my shepherd throughout the process. Press directors Rick Russell, Adam Kane, Janice Jorgensen, a longtime friend who provided oral history help and always moral support and comfort. For the production of the finished book, Susan Corrado and Rachel Crawford did yeoman work, and Jackie Barnes and Jack Russell have done a great job in promoting it. I had to go back and find people who had known Lee or who'd corresponded with those who knew Lee I went to Versailles, Kentucky, and met a lady, probably in her 80s. Her husband, Evan, had done the research for a book on Lee, and then he died before he could get it written, and she turned over everything, no strings attached, things I could not have found from any other sources. There included was a handwritten letter from Chester Nimitz. In Rock Island, Illinois, I had great help from Lee's nephew, Don Siders, and from the family historian, his sister-in-law, Margaret Allen. Then I went to Pennsylvania to interview Gilliam Ertzen and his wife, Mary. Gill was Lee's flag lieutenant, saw him on a daily basis from 1942 until the day Lee died, so you could not get a more intimate look than the Ertzens provided. I am grateful to the many others who shared their recollections because he did not produce any reminiscences of his own, so it, it was through the eyes of others. And what I learned is that Lee was a shining example of the principle that loyalty down produces loyalty up. Finally, I salute the team at home. My wife, Karen, whom I've been married to for nearly 52 years. Our sons, Joseph, Robert, and James. 
they have lived with this project for many, many years, and now it has come to fruition. Thank you very much. All right, that concludes the awards portion of our annual meeting program. I will now turn the stage back over to Admiral Daly, and we will move forward. Okay, well, congratulations again to all our SA Award winners and authors of the year. Let's give them one more hand. As I mentioned earlier, I think we are at a critical juncture where we need debate, not just among Navy, Marine Corps, and Coast Guard professionals, but also with national leaders and the American public about the vital contribution of sea power to national security. The American Sea Power Project just entered phase two, as we mentioned, going from ends to the ways of strategy. We're very honored to have three of the distinguished article contributors to the series with us here tonight. And I'll do introductions and then ask them to come up together on the stage. The Honorable John F. Lehman served six years as Secretary of the Navy in the Reagan administration. He's chairman of J.F. Lehman and Company, a private equity investment firm. He served 25 years in the Naval Reserve as a Naval Aviator. In other extensive national service, he was a staff member for Dr. Henry Kissinger on the National Security Council. He served as a delegate to the force reductions negotiations in Vienna and as deputy director of the U.S. Arms Control and Disarmament Agency. He served as a member of the 911 Commission. Professor Sarah Sally Payne is, a, is the William S. Sims University Professor of History and Grand Strategy at the Naval War College. She lectures in geopolitics, Mao Zedong, World War II, the Chinese Civil War, the Russo-Japanese, Korean, Vietnam, and Cold Wars. She spent over eight years overseas, including Taiwan and Japan, and a year each in China and Russia. Her focus is on the relations among China, Russia, and Japan, as well, on the, as, well as on the operational and strategic effects of naval blockades, commerce raiding, naval coalitions, peripheral operations, and non-military uses of navies. Our third panelist is Dr. Thomas G. Mencken, who's president and chief executive officer of the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments. He's a senior research professor at the Johns Hopkins University's Paul H. Nitze School of Advanced International Studies. He currently serves as a member of the congressionally mandated National Defense Strategy Commission. His previous government career includes service as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Policy Planning from 2006 to 2009. He helped craft the 2006 Quadrennial Defense Review and the 2008 National Defense Strategy. He served 24 years as an officer in the U.S. Navy Reserve to include tours in Iraq and Kosovo. I asked them all to come up and join me on the stage. Thank you. Have a seat. Well, I've been looking forward to this discussion, and uh, we thought we'd just go right into a discussion. And uh, we also, just to remind, we'll have an opportunity for questions and answers um, from the audience. But we'll get started up here with a few uh, a few icebreakers. So the first one, you know, it reminds me, Secretary Lehman, that when you served as Secretary of the Navy, there was no, uh, no concern about what the threat was. You knew what the threat was. It was well established. And, uh, you know, it seems like in our recent history, we've had problem deciding who the threat is. And uh, so the key advantage I think you had back then is you knew with a clear-eyed view who the pacing threat was. Uh, and as late as 2016, 
DOD wasn't allowed to call the PRC a competitor, much less a pacing threat. And only recently has the national defense strategy uh, called out the PRC as the pacing threat. And uh, to further complicate things, they're meeting and exceeding their stretch goals in many ways. So some of the voices that thought that we had enough time on this till the next century, or the next decade in the 2030s, now you hear some pretty responsible and experienced voices say, maybe 2027, maybe 2028. So uh, Dr. Mencken, you wrote that we suffer from a critical deficit in strategic thinking about the most consequential challenge of the, of the decade, which is of the current era, which is the rise of China and the threat it poses. So I'll start with you and Secretary Lehman, and I'll start with uh, Dr. Mencken. How does being late to recognize the China threat and the acceleration of its efforts affect our strategy, and do we have the right element of urgency? Well, thanks. Uh, first off, I mean, it's, it's an honor to be here with you all uh, this afternoon and be here with the, uh, the award winners, share the stage with you, Admiral, as Secretary Lehman and, and my longtime uh, Naval War College colleague, uh, Professor Payne. But look, we, we, we are late to the game, um, but that's sort of the American way, right? <laughs> I think it's, it's, it's deeply encoded in our, in our cultural DNA that we believe in cooperation and can't we all just get along and aren't we all just the same? And whether it's the challenge posed by China today, the, the challenge posed uh, by the Soviet Union at the beginning of the Cold War, the challenge posed by uh, Imperial Japan, Nazi Germany uh, in the 20s and 30s, we're, we're often late to the game. Um, but we're, we're in the game. And as, as you say, I think it, it, it's important that we now have a discussion, a debate, and action uh, when it comes to thinking about not just 21st century competition, but the growing possibility of 21st century great power conflict. And I think one of the other kind of cultural traits we have uh, as, as Americans, I think it's as Westerners more broadly, is we, 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 we think that um, saying something makes it happen. So talking about conflict somehow is gonna make it happen. Now, the historian in me uh, is it pains to find a case when that actually has been the case in the past, where right? merely saying something, the magic power of words has caused a war, uh, as opposed to differences of interest and, uh, and uh, aggression. So I think we, in fact, we need to shift from worrying about saying things, making it so, to actually, we, we do need to say things. And we need to say things as part of a professional discourse to develop strategies, to develop concepts, and also, Saying is, not, is, is no longer sufficient. We also have to be doing as well. Uh, so from an organization that traditionally talked about thinking two to three decades in the future, no, the, the time to not just think but do is, is, is now. Thank you. And uh, for Secretary Lehman, do you think that being late to the party has hurt us? And how do we make, make up ground? What is the urgency today? Well, I think... Uh, uh, I agree with uh, my compatriot here that uh, we're always late to the party, and that's the uh, nature of democracy. There, uh, I can't think of any event uh, in the past 300 years where a true democracy has been ahead of the game. So that's the reality. What we do now that we do, I think, uh, as, a, as a, a nation, a public, a, uh, uh, an intellectual elite, recognize that we face some very uh, serious and uh, existential uh, problems and adversaries. The beginning of wisdom is to recognize that and to build a strategy. I think there are two things uh, that are most heavily missing today in our Navy and Marines. That is that uh, there uh, is a, uh, as I've uh, railed like the crazy uncle in the attic on this for some years. We have adopted a culture since uh, uh, since the scandals of uh, of the 90s of zero tolerance, and and this is a very toxic and uh, uh, dangerous position 
to have our Navy uh, walking around bragging about uh, not accepting any, ex any mistakes by our young upcoming uh, officers and NCOs. Never has this been part of the culture in uh, the Navy. Uh, now it is, and it's got to be dropped right away because it is, it is driving out uh, uh, holes of some of the best people. I've written previously that uh, the four uh, five stars that won World War II in today's Navy uh, could not get promoted beyond lieutenant, maybe lieutenant commander in Leahy's uh, uh, case, uh, but they, they made mistakes. All leaders, all great leaders make mistakes in, in youth and learn from them. We allow no mistakes. Uh, one DUI and uh, you're out. Uh, that's crazy. I mean, when I went through flight school, you had to have at least three DUIs to, <laughs> to, to get through. So we're, we're really uh, conditioning our young, uh, our, our young leaders that have what it really takes, and that is a minority in any group. Uh, we're convincing them over time, much as these uh, wonderful people that you've selected correctly for, for awards, they still have a fire in the belly, but we are grinding that out of them. We no longer, you know, when Nimitz put his uh, first command on the rocks, there was a protective society that saw in him a, a, a really major potential leadership. And they protected him. They punished him, uh, but they didn't throw him out. Today, uh, you throw out somebody that uh, puts, uh, puts their ship on the rocks. So that's the biggest problem. The next and it comes directly from the fact that we drive out so many of our th real thinking leaders at a young age, is we have no strategy. We haven't had a strategy, really, since, uh, 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 since the Reagan-Bush era. And uh, the, the, uh, the problem is that this is sort of the first period of 30-some years where the Navy has not had its strategy. I mean, we went all through the 20s and 30s, developing and wargaming the rainbow uh, war plans. That, those were strategies. We included Britain and Germany and uh, quite a few other surprising uh, examples, and of course, Japan. So we've got to get back to strategy first, because it's got to be strategy, then requirements, how many ships, how many jets, submarines do we need? And then uh, we've got to go out and sell that. It's not, we've had to reverse in the last uh, uh, couple of decades that we go, oh, well, the strategy comes from the budget. We wait for we have a budget cut passed by Congress. Well, sir, you've, you've touched on culture, uh, the need for strategy, uh, recognizing that some of the risk takers have been driven out. And I was going to ask uh, Dr. Payne, who's up at the War College, um, and we talked about the urgency and the clarity that comes with knowing who you're going to fight. Is, is what Secretary Lehman just said about the last 30 years, was that a problem because we didn't have the, the identified specific threats that we'd had before and only are now coming back to that? What's your view? Did we need that? To get, to get it right? I think the threats have been similar. They're the continentalists. And the continentalists want to divide the war, world into spheres of influence, and you've had fascist variants of this over time. And we in the West want a universal world order based on universal rules to minimize transaction costs. This is how you build tra uh, prosperous societies. And we look at, and you ask, well, why do we come late to the game? Because we're looking at the continentalists and going, you can't be serious, <laughs> right? You really don't want to do this. Right. Uh, World War looks this way, and even the victors, in some respects, it's Pyrrhic, that you're better off not fighting these things. However, um, I think it's really important to understand the difference between a maritime outlook uh, on, this, on trade. The Navy is so intimately connected with, 
with trade. In fact, it's a service that is most intimately connected with the civilian economy. And the Navy doesn't get credit because it's often pursuing negative objectives, preventing people from doing crazy things to inter interrupt the commons and things like that. And so a good Navy day is when precisely nothing happens. So it looks like, well, who, what did the Navy do for me lately? Yeah. A lot. Yeah. And uh, so I don't think the, the it's, uh, we are late to the game. The problem is continuous with continentalists trying to cause all sorts of troubles. And we've now, we thought it was China. And for the moment, it's now Vladimir uh, Putin working his magic. But I think one of the things that Americans should be really aware, uh, aware of is one of our greatest gifts is the gifts of geography, which is sanctuary at home. And during World War, the last uh, hot war, World War, uh, no one could touch us at home. And that's not true anymore. So when you're developing your strategy to deal with China, uh, do, uh, think about not cornering them in such a way when they decide that their last day is also going to be our last day when they come in. It's something that we need to consider this time around. Thank you. Um, you know, one, one item that was mentioned earlier by one of our award winners was the idea of uh, integrated deterrence. Mm -hmm. And it figures um, in the national defense strategy, which uh, mere mortals haven't been able to read yet, but there are like a two, there's like a two page unclassified piece, but a lot of references to integrated deterrence. And as I understand it, integrated deterrence is all domain deterrence. But um, I was struck by a comment that General Berger made uh, last, last fall. And he said, how good is your deterrence if you watch the Chinese take those atolls, build mountains of sand, construct the runways, build the uh, revetments, put the missiles in, and what, what, did, what is deterrence if you don't deter that? So uh, it strikes me that the Chinese have an idea of deterrence that's whole of government. Mm -hmm. They'll threaten, they'll cajole, they'll use all their elements of power. Are we being smart about that? And I'll, I'll start with Dr. Mencken. Well, you, with, with, in mentioning integrated deterrence, you, you uh, threatened to bring out the grammarian in me. Um, <laughs> and I, maybe it's appropriate. My, my, high school English teacher who I owe so much to just passed away a couple weeks ago at the age of 97. And uh, she always taught, you know, that the, the noun's more important than the adjective. So uh, whether we're talking about hybrid warfare or integrated deterrence, let's focus on deterrence. And at least for me, I tend to go the other way, which is to be very specific. Who is it that we seek to deter from doing what? And then, and then how? Uh, you know, are we seeking to deter Xi Jinping from using force against Taiwan. Um, and, and t unless and until you can have that type of a, a, a focused appreciation, I think it really is hard to deter. Now to this, to, but to the, to, to the point of the contrast between the way we think about deterrence, you know, I'd say in, in the West and in the United States, and, and here I'm really uh, stepping on Professor Payne's uh, territory, but compared to the way the Chinese seem to formulate it, look, we are, we're, uh, we're, uh, we're splitters, not lumpers, right? So we tend to think about all these elements of national power. And we tend to be organized according to those uh, elements of national powers. And as the, uh, the founders intended, we, we tend to be organized poorly uh, to execute those, those elements of power, right? We're not, we're not designed for the efficient uh, use of all these instruments, uh, again, uh, like, like authoritarians are. You look at the Chinese view, I think it's a much more graduated view. You know, we think of war versus peace. I think they see a much more uh, graduated continuum. Um, we think of, you know, is it, we think about the dime, or God help us, the dime fill, or I'm sure it's gotten, it, the acronym, like all other acronyms, kind of grows. Uh, we break things down. Um, I, so I think th thinking in terms of integrated deterrence for us doesn't come naturally. And I think we should ask why that is. And again, I think a lot of that is, is encoded in our cultural DNA and it's encoded in our laws. And until we conquer that, I don't think we're gonna have a lot of success. And more broadly, I don't think we're gonna out authoritarian the authoritarians when it comes to harnessing all of our natu national assets. Thank you. I was gonna throw the next to uh, Secretary Lehman and see if you had an idea about this idea of deterrence. Do we have it right? I think some of the recent Ukraine-Russia uh, stuff has taught us what works, what doesn't, mostly what doesn't, but I wanted to throw it to you. 
Yeah, I think de deterrence uh, is e exactly the heart of what uh, what we're we're all about. And deterrence is nothing complex. It's just convincing your potential adversaries that if they choose to use force against us and us being ourselves and our allies, that they will suffer far more than uh, than they can hope to gain. Deterrence is not working today because uh, the Chinese and uh, the Russians and the Iranians and the North Koreans see us as a declining power. Uh, the new budget that goes to the Hill two weeks ago calls for cutting the Navy, reducing the number of ships. Uh, how is that integrated deterrence? This is, you know, uh, it, it's something that has to be uh, believable and understood by our potential adversaries in simple declarative sentences. If you do this, these are going to be the consequences. And we had a big debate about this uh, in, uh, in the 80s because uh, we had a, a president who said our strategy for the Cold War is we win, they lose. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was his strategy. And so we set about, we the naval services, the Air Force, and also the Army laterally, uh, we set about demonstrating that to the, to the Soviets. And uh, the only way you can do that is to go up there and show them you can do it, and they can't stop us. And we're not doing any of that today. And uh, so we're not deterring. I don't think we're deterring uh, uh, Putin in, uh, uh, in the current war in Ukraine. I don't think we're really deterring. I think Putin is deterring the Chinese from going into <laughs> Taiwan. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, don't, I don't think we are. So that is the heart of it. That's what we've got to focus on. How do we be believable to our adversaries as we are serious? And that's what we don't have. Well, you know, deterrence is so much in the eyes of the receiver. And uh, Dr. Payne, you've spent so much time over there. When you look at what we're sending, <coughs> knowing what you know from your experience over there, um, having spent so much time in Asia, um, are we sending the right thing to get the right response? First, I'm going to make a caveat. For anyone who wears glasses, you go into the Oculus and they, they go, well, is this lens better or is that lens better? <laughs> this one better, that one? You mull it over, which one's worse? Uh, <laughs> I can tell you that each time I write a book, I get one click a little better. So what I'm giving you is not 20-20. And also one of the keys when you're assessing others is you have a hypothesis of what you think they're thinking or what they're doing. And I encourage you to be, get comfortable with the counter argument because when you realize the counter argument's right and you're wrong, adopt the counter argument. <laughs> so that being said, um, the problem with Putin and Xi Jinping in my books, and maybe I'm wrong because only the psychoanalyst would probably know for sure and that guy's probably dead. <laughs> anyway, um, I think they're both on death ground at home in different ways. And Putin has really done a job with Ukraine on cornering himself. And by death ground, I mean they have only, their only hope of probably physical survival is to keep marching forward because of uh, Xi Jinping. He, well, he cheated on a deal. He shouldn't have actually become the head when he did, it was Borshilai, I believe, was the guy whose turn was, had come up, and now that guy's in jail with his wife. And Putin, they, but they both ultimately have these non-performing economies. This is the problem with being a continentalist. You drive the car into the ground if this is your operating way you're running an economy. This is why Americans are so opposed to continentalists. It doesn't work, and then it makes them grabby and desperate for other people's stuff. So. <laughs> This is, one, these, this is a problem. When you want to deter someone who's on death ground, uh, it's difficult. Mm -hmm. And the Soviets were a much more organized system. Uh, Putin started out as a street th thug. And he's 20 years in. This is what it looks like. And uh, Xi Jinping, sadly, never had a good education. He was a cultural revolution, et cetera. So um, if you can't deter them, 
And maybe you can encourage them to make really rotten decisions that waste money, like thinking a train system is ever going to deliver anything but big, big debts that no one's ever going to pay you for. So the more they want to invest in train systems to nowhere, you know, particularly now that it's all dead ended, you can't go through Russia and Ukraine now with that train system. And as for the islands, I, I mean, it's great. They've told us exactly where their stuff is. I guess we know where to get rid of it. <laughs> right? It's like, hello, there they are. <laughs> and he's uh, invested, Xi Jinping, on this 24-7 surveillance system, which if you think of the cost, if we decided to surveil each other in the United States the way they're doing it and getting everyone to rat out each other, uh, it would just wreck your economy. And that's where they're going. So since um, we may not be able to deter, well, let's keep encouraging the bad decisions. And the latest with Putin, if he decides that he has to go home to mother, which would be Xi Jinping, and he's going to try to reverse all these energy f flows, and the reason they don't go east is because it's not efficient to do it that way. So great, let's go be inefficient for the bad guys. Um, it, it's going to um, do a reversal of the Mongol yoke. And this terminology comes from Russian history when the Mongol Yuan dynasty conquered both China and Russia. The Russians were their tax collectors, and they really didn't much like it. Um, Putin is in real danger of becoming uh, the pawn of Xi Jinping. And that is a situation which you could actually love because they'll hate each other, they always have. <laughs> and making them work, this is what Eisenhower noticed, making them work closely together is a good thing because they don't work well together at all. <laughs> <laughs> that is good insight. <laughs> um, for Dr. Mencken, uh, you, know, you, you know, there's folks that assume always, and it drives me wild, uh, that the maneuver force of the Navy is somehow more vulnerable than fixed bases ashore. Mm -hmm. Like one old weapon hits one old Russian ship and people go, oof, we got to draw some big conclusions from that, you know. <laughs> Ships can sink. Mm -hmm. And uh, you conclude that the U.S. military, quote, the U.S. military in conjunction with allies and partners should create the virtues of mass without the vulnerabilities of concentration. Mm -hmm. Can you expand on that little sure. aspect? Sure, look, I think the, um, in an era of you know, widespread, ubiquitous precision, which is where we are, right? Better part of a century into the precision strike era, right? it started in, in World War II, it's kind of fully mature now. Um, you know, what, what you can, what you can find you can hit. Um, it is easier to hit fixed targets than mobile targets. It's easier to hit mobile targets today than it was 20 or 50 years ago, but there's still, there's still a, a difference there. Um, but in this era, it doesn't make sense to aggregate large, you know, large uh, dollops of military power in a vulnerable way. And whether that's on land or whether that's on sea or whether that's in space, um, so what we need to do is figure out how to, how to mass effects without creating you know, really lucrative, lucrative targets. Um, I think precision strike and, and, and advances in, in ISR really give us all sorts of opportunities to do that. And I think particularly when coupled with geography, you know, one of those things that just doesn't change or changes over the course of millennia uh, so that we don't almost, almost don't notice. Um, and I think there, the, the geography of the Western Pacific in particular is really advantageous to us. There are fixed locations. They happen to be our allies or our friends. And we want to be there and we want to defend them for all sorts of other reasons. We are going to be there and we are going to defend them. But we also have the expanses of the, of the oceans. That's our maneuver space. And, and we need to use each of those, those fixed locations and the maneuver space to, to our best advantage. Back to you know, looking at things from, uh, you know, from Beijing, things look a lot different, right? Those, those friends, those allies Beijing, of getting out and getting access to the broad oceans. So I think we're actually in a pretty favorable position if, if, we, if we really double down on the things that, that uh, confer advantage there. So for Secretary Lehman, you know, the, the, very success, the very success that you had back in the 80s has presented some problems now because the aircraft carriers that were built, the late 60s Nimitz design, which was Nimitz was mid-70s, and then most of those ships commissioned on your watch. The, uh, back in the 90s, we were uh, authorizing, in the late 80s, we were authorizing four or five DDGs a year. 
And now here we are also recapitalizing the uh, strategic nuclear deterrent. And the Navy's been told to self-fund the strategic nuclear deterrent. So you mentioned earlier, you know, we're not really selling it. We're not, we're not formulating a strategy. We're not compelling. And the budget was disappointing. What, what can we do to change that uh, calculus? Because if you look at maneuver warfare, if you look at the Indo-Pacific, if you look at China as the pacing threat, um, it's got maritime all over it. A really good question because, <clears throat> you know, in... Uh, in 1981, it was a similar situation. Uh, we laid out a strategy to uh, uh, be able to prevail against the Soviet Union. And we pretended we had it. We went up, uh, up north to the Norwegian Sea and uh, around the Cape in August, uh, eight months after the president was inaugurated with 83 ships and four carriers. But we had no ages. We didn't have the ants. We had no uh, uh, sea whiz. We had no, uh, we Close had hardly weapons. any. Uh, so, but we knew that we had to have a layered defense. And we had the outer air battle, which had been conceptually provided by three previous CNOs. And it required seven layers of defense. One layer you can always penetrate. Going all the way back to the first carrier in 1917, it, if you look at the, the uh, debate in the parliament, there's nothing new. Uh, you know, carriers could not survive. Why are we spending uh, this? You've got dirigibles and you've got bombers that can drop bombs on them. And, uh, but it, it, it's... Uh, uh, the problem we have is we really, as has been, I think, well said, uh, we have not maintained deterrence. So instead of seven layers, uh, right <coughs> after uh, uh, the end of history in, in 1991, and there was no more threat, and the best, our defense budget was cut 40%, uh, the seven layers were reduced to three and a half. They canceled the, the Phoenix missile, which is the best in the world for reaching out uh, 200 miles. The F-14 with its magnetron radar could see far better than any fighter in the, in the world. The Aegis cruisers uh, were early retired, uh, the first five of them. We had uh, uh, everything, all four of the long range aircraft that the Navy was developing and had developed were canceled. Uh, uh, and it was, it was just crazy. We cut our ability to defend our fleet. Uh, nobody wants, obviously, to mass all your goodies in, in uh, an easy target. But we weren't doing that at the time. But today, we only have the F-18, which is a third the range and payload of the F-14. It's slower. It's not an interceptor. It's a, uh, it's, it's a, a good bomber. Yeah, it's a, a, a good strike fighter. <clears throat> we don't have uh, anything like the kinds of weapons uh, in enough numbers. You know, here we are now. We've given away most of what we have for the key uh, air defense systems. And we got to restock, and now it's tough, tough time to restock. So uh, we, we've really got to recognize that it, it, you are going to get hit. I mean, we had 1,700 kamikazes with very smart guidance systems who were adapted to the adapted to the uh, uh, to the, the uh, as our ships, over a thousand of them. Uh, figured out how to get their dive bombing pop-ups and so forth. They then went to sea skimmers, and they were very effective. The, uh, they, uh, we lost effectively 34 uh, destroyers. They didn't all sink, but they were put totally out of action. We Totals. had five big carriers hit, although none of them sank, and uh, uh, four of them were able to be put back into, into service. The big, the big issue is building ships to go into harm's way that can survive. Of course you're going to get hit. You're not going to get hit as often as an Air Force base or an Army division if right. you go to all-out war, but you're going to get hit. Much rather be in a, uh, a target 
going 35 knots that has a thousand watertight compartments and three armored decks and triple right. under keel protection. Uh, uh, but you're going to get hit, and we do. We no longer, in our present situation, after all the cuts that were never made up, uh, uh, we we can't deal with the kind of stream raids, even that that we faced then with the backfire and their big uh, S4 uh, anti-ship missiles. <clears throat> we've got to get that back, and we've got to spend. And we've got to get up and to Congress and sell and explain to them. That's what nobody's been doing that. Why? I don't know. It's marketing. I think it comes down to marketing. And um, so for Dr. Payne, I wanted to just shift a moment because of your specialty. You know, Dr. Nick Lambert argued in his article that the current globalized economy presents naval challenges and opportunities fundamentally different than what were posed in World War II. In essence, he argued for, he argued for a broader strategic role for naval forces and protecting our own allies and uh, mostly based on economics. Do you think that the Navy is being properly used? Are we too much force on force or should we look much more closely at this economic aspect of warfare? I'm surrounded with a great deal of expertise here and I'm just gonna uh, make a, a comment about a Navy mission that I think would be helpful to consider, and then I got people who know more about it than I do, and happy to hear counter arguments, is um, that the lifeblood of the international system, even as we return some, some supply chains home, is the fact that we all trade with each other, and this is all maritime trade, and oh, by the way, we communicate on the web and everything else is by cables, undersea, et cetera. And then, this you can make a very powerful argument to Congress about, that the whole economy just depends on this. And you all don't see anything because it's all working today. But the moment it gets threatened, you're going to have a, a heart attack about this. And we seem to have some objective examples from COVID yeah. and the disruptions we've seen. We couldn't even make masks like the one I was wearing today. Uh, <laughs> it, it's incredible. And I think a role, and then I'll stand to be corrected on either side of me, that I think navies need to consider is convoying. And also, uh, you, if we get into a real problem with China, I would think China's not set up to do a global war. Why? Because it imports energy and food, and that's a real problem in wartime. Oh, and by the way, it has way too many neighbors, and most of their neighbors hate them for excellent reasons. And then it is surrounded by narrow, shallow, island-cluttered seas that in wartime become kill zones. Do we technically don't have to go there? They, of course, do, because they live there. So uh, on, if you're going to shut down Chinese trade or portions of it, I presume it's through impounding merchantmen. Oh, by the way, it's great that they own the merchantmen, so it makes it more fun when you impound them. Uh, <laughs> right? Uh, we haven't actually had a big merchant marine since the Civil War. We got rid of ours <coughs> then, the big one. Um, but in thinking in terms also of convoying stuff, we assume all these mega ships get through. Who knows what the uh, countermeasures of other people will be? But if you want to protect trade, and uh, that will get the attention of all the Wall Street bottom line kind of people. <laughs> Thank you. Now I was going to open it up. I'll, I'll ask one more question, but then I ask people to come up to the mics and uh, be free to ask a question and. Uh, I hope you take advantage of the uh, excellent folks we have here on the panel. Um, but I'd like to just ask one more question. If you had to pick just one or two things that are do nows for the Navy and the Marine Corps, um, what would you pick as your do nows? Just one or two. And I'll, I'll go to you first, uh, Secretary Lehman. Well, I've already said what we, I firmly believe we have to do soon, and one is to change this corruption of, of, of Navy uh, culture and get rid of zero tolerance. It is, it's, it, it's destroyed morale, it's, it's driven top-notch people out, and then, that's the beginning of wisdom, then the, the second most urgent thing is to declare to first, it's not, look, good, as everybody knows, good strategy is not uh, 180 pages long. 
It's simple declarative uh, 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 sentences that are impeccable logic, just like Reagan started out. And then we followed up by saying, oh, okay, yeah, we're going to go up. Uh, up to the Norwegian Sea where we can really kick ass and you can't stop us. We're going in the fjords and operate our carriers there. They can't, can't find us. And uh, in other words, to, to project that you know what you're doing and you are going to win. But we did, as I mentioned earlier, this was all bluff in 81, 82 because we didn't have those weapons. But we did have previous naval leaders that insisted that what was needed to, to uh, deal with the Soviet and the Chinese threat uh, was developed and was there uh, when an administration that wanted to build the Navy and increase in, you know, I was told uh, it, by every admiral really, in the beginning, the first weeks I was uh, in office, that oh, Congress will never support that. Reagan increased defense in, in the three initiatives he did in the first year by 20%. And today, you talk to the Navy uh, programmers about this, oh, no, they'll never, Congress will never sit still for that. Well, they weren't sit sitting still for it until the Navy went up and told them why and showed them the rationale and the logic that was behind it. So, first, get rid of zero tolerance, and second, let's build a strategy, even if we can't, uh, can't f uh, flesh it out in the first couple of years. We can bluff. We can let them know that this is what we're going to do, and when we get it, we're, we're really going to be able to cream you guys, and that's really what won the Cold War, because they could see that the free world was developing. It was building its defenses. It, and then, of course, we threw in the, the Psy War by having uh, Star Wars, which nobody believed in. And we got Bob, Bob Ballard to go out and find the Titanic and uh, show our robotics to the Russians. And they said, my God, what, what else do they have if they're showing us this? So it's, you know, it's, it's leadership. It's leadership. Uh, and okay. we've got to get back to it. Dr. Payne. Uh, I guess two things. Uh, one, uh, as a professor, I guess I take an academic look. Define your policy objective, which I believe is maintaining the rules-based global order. And if that's the case, uh, what are the naval missions that, instead of thinking of the operational level, they've got certain forces and i got certain forces and how in this particular battle I wipe out larger numbers of their forces or whatever it is, but think about uh, the political effects of what you do, et cetera. And then now for heresy. Uh, and this is an outsider's view. Uh, after working for over 20 years for the Navy, I think your promotion system is in terrible shape. <laughs> um, and here's my reasoning. Uh, I look at Fat Leonard that went on for years. Everyone knew about it. They must have. You can't be that stupid not to know about it. Uh, do you have two Aegis uh, destroyers that can't navigate in peacetime? You have uh, major weapon systems that are just a mess and don't do the basic stuff they're supposed to. And I look at the promotion system, and what it does is it, the no fault thing is one of them. Another one is uh, it, uh, it penalizes truth to power. Also, it penalizes bad news to power. Mm -hmm. That accurate, bad news, timely would be early. Uh, that's not career enhancing. And um, I, as far as I can tell, it, uh, moral color, courage is another thing that gets penalized. And it needs to be fixed. I actually think there's a fairly easy way to fix it, Naval War College. If you all made that a project for one of the classes and they divided up to groups, competitive, you would learn exactly how to fix the Navy promotion system. But um, it's, uh, the pr and so now we've got leadership and ethics. That's a mi misidentification of the problem. The problem is that people are incentivized to make poor leadership decisions or unethical decisions because in order to get promoted to the next rank, you have to play certain uh, rules. Anyway, so now I'm going to get ushered out of the room. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you do bring up you do bring up an excellent point. You show me any organization 
where it's one strike and you're out, people will lie, cheat, and steal, and not tell the truth because the consequences are horrible and um, lethal. So Dr. Mencken, you get the last one before we have somebody come up to the mic. Yeah, so one word, focus, right? So as a global power, it's extremely difficult for us to focus. We need to focus. Focus on the, the strategic challenges, focus on the concrete operational challenges, and vigorously, ruthlessly, game them out, debate them, discuss them, take no prisoners. Um, just, you know, just as we've done successfully in the past. Uh, it, time, time's, clock, clock is ticking. So focus, we need to, we need to really focus. Thank you, as I offer, I think some people are approaching the mic here. Good afternoon and thanks for your time. Uh, Secretary Lehman, I'm struck by your comments about uh, the maritime strategy. Mike, would you identify yourself? I know. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Rear Admiral retired Mike Mann. And I've been a member of the Naval Institute since 1968, although Pete doesn't recognize that exactly. <laughs> he had broken service. <laughs> I have all the proceedings since 68. Um, what do you think of the comment on the Marine Corps' exec, uh, expeditionary advance based operations as a construct for a strategy to deter? Uh, he's, you know, he's effectively driving the Navy to buy upwards of 50 to 80 uh, amphibious ships. And he's wrapped himself around the distributed maritime operations. I mean, together those two things seem like a, a potential maritime strategy, an effective maritime strategy. But I really question the logic of putting a small group of Marines on an island somewhere and turning them on with uh, anti-ship cruise missiles and anti-submarine capabilities. What do, you th what do you think of all of that? Uh, I, I think uh, he's the only chief who's really thinking out of the box, and you're right. He's, it's raising all sorts of, of uh, issues, but I think he's right. I think he's valley, val valid that we should, there are 50,000 islands in the Pacific, 50,000. And most of them are uninhabited, but many of them uninhabited. You could put a force in there that could uh, uh, fly like a butterfly, sting like a bee, and then move on. And uh, you know, it's it's nothing. There's nothing new in the world. And strategy in the Civil War was hit them where they ain't. Well, that's what he's trying to do. <clears throat> I think he's thinking too much in the box about the size of the force structure that he needs. Uh, he needs more aviation. He's cut aviation much too short because the Naval Department, the Marines and the Navy have no replacements. And essentially, neither does the Air Force. So you lose, start losing aircraft like the Russians are in, mm -hmm. in Ukraine, and you've got nothing to replace them. So I think that he's started the kernel of thinking outside the box. The last thing we want to do is to send a fleet into the South China Sea. Mm -hmm. <coughs> the, the, uh, the objective of the Chinese is to have six carrier battle groups to be able to go out and, and establish their suzerainty in the first, at least first two uh, rings of islands. Uh, so I, I, I applaud what he's doing. Uh, and uh, he's demonstrating how terrible, the terrible things that, that Goldwater Nichols uh, have inflicted on our senior uh, 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 leaders in the Pentagon. Everything has to be integrated. Everything has to be joint. Well, there's some islands that you don't need uh, an army division for. Uh, there, you know, my experience has, in, in studying many of the writers in this uh, room today, uh, their histories of strategy in World War II and other, uh, uh, other wars, is the, the concept that the services can't uh, live together is one that is located here in Washington. But every time we needed the Air Force or the Air Force needed us, uh, we worked it out. 
the Air Force equipped their F-111s and their B-52s and, and the B-1s with mine laying capability, with harpoon missile shooting capability. Nobody, we had, didn't have to be told by congressional staffers who were uh, the people who drafted Goldwater Nichols. It was common sense and good leadership. Good leaders don't need to be told, oh, you should understand, you should go to, you should spend four years of your career uh, as uh, on a staff reading newspapers instead of being out at sea where you learn not to run into each other. Sorry. No. I'm, I'm, still, I'm still waiting for my first day of JPME, so I, I'm relating to this. So. I'm going to go over here to Robbie Harris. Robbie. Uh, Robbie Harris, a former naval person. Um, fantastic panel. Uh, thank you much, and thank you, Pete, for the, uh, uh, this annual meeting. The, the best ever, I think, so thank you very much. Hey, um, a number of people believe that the root cause of Navy's problems today is, is Goldwater Nichols. And if you, if you fix Goldwater Nichols, Navy's problems go away. Uh, I, I would like for the panel to react to that. Do you agree with that? Who should go first? Uh, <laughs> mine. I, I'll, I'll, I'll take a look. I'll take a stab <laughs> at it, which is, you know, somebody who's been an, you know, uh, uh, an academic for a good part of my uh, career. It's a wonderful academic question. But it is that, right? I mean, it's the world that we live in. We live in the post-1986 era. So... Um, we got, we got to move on with the tools that we have. Uh, yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I plead innocence. <laughs> I, I plead guilty. I think it's the worst <laughs> piece of legislation that has weakened our defense uh, severely. The fact that it takes us now uh, 25 years to develop a simple, it's not so simple, but it's a lot simpler the F-35, the same, actually the F-22 took two years longer than that to get the first squadron IO, IOC. And our adversaries do it in seven years. We used to do it in four years. The, from the back of the envelope, uh, the Air Force developed the Minuteman and deployed it for its a complete field four years before Minuteman was operational. We did the, the uh, uh, Polaris project, sure. new submarine, new launching system, new solid fuel, new uh, missile, integrated missile, new guidance system for the sub, uh, inertial guidance system, entirely new, brand new uh, 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 guidance, uh, stellar inertial guidance for the missiles. We did it in four years from the, literally the back of the envelope, or it was a napkin, I guess, that, and the deployment of the George Washington fully operational, four years, and now it takes us, it takes us by direction in, uh, in the regulations, the defense acquisition regulations, it takes minimum of five and a half years just to get an agreed integrated requirement. This is unilateral disarmament. That's why uh, we're in the state we're in. It's a lousy piece of legislation and has got to be reformed or ignored and move on. We're gonna, we're gonna put you down as a no. <laughs> <laughs> this gentleman over here was next. Hi, um, I just wanna uh, echo what the previous person said. This has been a great panel, enjoyed it. I also want to put in a plug for USNI's emails. It, you know, it's the best thing out there. It's great having those every day to actually get the, the straight facts. Um, moving on from that, um, I'd sort of like to turn this to the political standpoint. And going back to 1981, um, Secretary Lehman, correct me if I'm wrong, but you had a lot of bipartisan support in the House and Senate at that time. It, you know, it wasn't overwhelming, but you had a lot. You also had some incredible leaders like Senator John Warner at that time. Long may he live. Um, I look at now and looking at the Republican Party that used to be a strong supporter, and you see it now that they aren't supporting it. Um, you see people like Trump and people who have Trump's endorsements uh, suggesting very strongly we shouldn't be doing anything to help Ukraine. 
So I guess this sort of looks as, at a larger thing. If we want to rebuild the Navy, if we want to do the things we need to be, and it seems as though we need some sort of bipartisan support. Uh, does anybody have any thoughts on that? Um, do we need it? How do we get there? Any, any ideas? A absolutely. That is a, a critical point. We could not have done in the Reagan administration what was done without the bipartisanship. In the previous administration, we had a president who was an, a, a, a continentalist, not a navalist. But we had a, a, a defense leadership uh, that really, I think, understood. They, 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 uh, they knew we had sooner or later to deal with what the Soviet Union was doing in its uh, stealing technology and building uh, a, a large navy. And, uh, and so uh, Harold Brown, the Secretary of Defense, uh, a lifelong Democrat, uh, kept all these Navy programs alive, the Slick 32, all of the Sea Whiz, all of the Aegis, uh, everything that won the Cold War for the Navy uh, was kept alive and funded uh, in, in the, the previous two administrations. And uh, they built the capabilities, not in the numbers, but they at least no, yeah, the they they developed, paid to develop it. All we had to do was uh, say, "I'll buy this and this and this and this and this," while we were bluffing the the world, saying we can already deal with the the backfire stream raids when we couldn't, but we three years later we could and proved it. So uh, yes, we've got to get to buy, back to bipartisanship. And I think the Armed Services Committee mm -hmm. uh, uh, today, certainly in the Senate, I'm less familiar with the, the House, but the uh, Senate Armed Services Committee does have that, that spirit. It's pretty, pretty uh, uh, bipartisan. Of course, with Scoop Jackson and uh, the, uh, of John Tower and John Warner, uh, leaders of both Democratic side and Republican side, uh, they were lib the re Democrats tended to be fairly liberal, except the Southerners uh, on uh, social issues, and but strong on defense, even though their administration wasn't. When a, a Republican administration uh, came in, we had that bipartisan support on the Hill, and you know I spent half my time, as did most of the uh, defense officials, up on the Hill for at least the first half of the year not just testifying, but lobbying, taking, taking them to lunch and, and working the staffers. I don't get the sense that that's happening today. You've got to sell, you've got to, you've got to declare in simple declarative sentences what you're, why you're up here, what is the strategy, and be able to explain the strategy and have every sailor and every naval ship understand it because it's just a few logical syllogisms to explain. We're not doing that. In defense of the current CNO, you know, I interviewed him a couple weeks ago, and I really looked deep into what he was doing with the budget, especially because it has been, you know, a subject of some <laughs> discussion. And uh, it basically occurred to me that there's many similarities to what you just described. You had that post-Vietnam era mm -hmm. where they kept those fires burning. It was like the monks up in the. Mm -hmm. the up at the top with the, with the original Hebrew and Latin mm -hmm. Greek texts, but they kept those fires burning. And he basically submitted a budget where he said, look, I look at this as three things, readiness, capability, and capacity. And if I can't buy the capacity now, I gotta do the first two. And it reminds me a lot of what you just said. And I think that we're talking about these numbers, these big numbers, like 500 if you include the unmanned and partially or op optionally manned. And uh, I think that's what he's trying to do. And I also think that, um, you know, maybe as part of selling it, they got to get out from under the self-funding, the uh, strategic. Uh, well, that's a good term. point because uh, the, the Armed Services Committee, uh, in the last budget that John McCain produced in the Senate Armed Services Committee, had that come out of a pool and that it was, you know, the, the budget would be, would fund the strategic pool. The, the Air Force 
uh, needed a new bomber. The, they needed a new ICBM to put in the holes. And the Navy uh, needed the new uh, uh, boomers. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and out of that, the Army was supposed to pitch in a third to this, this pool. And Trump exempted them and made, he's the one that changed it so that only the Navy paid for the boomers and only the Air Force paid for the bomber and the, and the missile. And the Army got off scot-free and, and ended up during that administration, the Army got three to 5% more than the other service, other two services every year. For what? I know. Uh, Tom, I you had something to throw yeah, in Yeah, look, I mean, I think, um, we should talk about where we are right now, which is, I think, you know, we are in a very fluid moment in history uh, when it comes to our national defense, our, our, our national security. And things are, I always like to say, things are inconceivable until they become conceivable. And I think with the, you know, the, the, the war that's going on now in Ukraine, the demonstration of just what, you know, a glimpse at what 21st century high intensity warfare actually looks like and entails and will entail, I think it's waking a lot of people up. And so I think, you know, those, those embers are burning and we'll have to see how they, you know, how they're, how they're ignited. But to, I think it was to, you know, to Sally's previous point, um, look, I think by and large, whether it's the American people or members of Congress, they want to do the right thing. They just don't know what the right thing is, and they need people to help them understand what the right thing is. And because I think, by and large, the people that I grew up with in Southern California, they assume we're all doing the right thing. They pay their taxes, they, you know, they work, and they think we're, we're, we're doing the right thing. And so I think we need to you know, be good stewards of their resources, good stewards of their trust. So I don't know if you had to weigh in on that before we go to our last question. Well, with, I'm uh, thinking Kelly. about it. it's uh, everyone's talking here. And, oh, well, I think of uh, history, there are certain eras or periods that are absolutely pivotal where, I mean, every, it, it's always ongoing change, but sometimes it's just whatever is happening in the future, it's going to be really different from the past. And for me, COVID has uh, changed all sorts of things like how we're going to work in the future, et cetera, and uh, understanding how we're going to work for supply chains, all sorts of things. And now, of course, this war in Ukraine, and I believe I'm not the only person who's figured out that the world has changed, because you can watch European leaders from big countries in Europe to small, they have reassessed on a dime. Mm -hmm. And then you brought up the point that we have a whole series of equipment that was bought a long time ago, mm -hmm. and actually it's probably fortunate it's all going bad right now, mm -hmm. because we're at a pivotal moment where now what you're doing is so valuable with your American Sea Prior, uh, Power Project is this is the moment to really think carefully of what sort of platforms do you need? Uh, I don't, I'm not advocating get, uh, prematurely getting rid of big things that we have, but we're watching Ukraine mm -hmm. taking, well, I realize the Russians are incompetent, I got that. Uh, <laughs> even I figured that out. Uh, but we're watching small things taking out big things and thinking about how we want to invest in the future. So in a weird way, um, uh, this is actually a good moment to rethink things. And also, I'm going to make a plug for democracy, mm -hmm. is that the problem, we think of these uh, dictatorial places that, boy, they can get things done. Yeah, they can. Look at all the bad decisions <laughs> Xi Jinping and Putin are making. What person in their right mind would make these decisions? That we have a very messy process but it, uh, our messy squabbling with each other is how we get good decisions. Mm -hmm. and, um, and wondering what, there were one, one of the questions you sent around was about what are the instruments of national power? How do you integrate them? That's what the cabinet's call. That all those portfolios, those are the instruments of national power. So actually, I think we're gonna be in a good place. And the fact that you all are here and engaged is part of the good place. We'll all work together and make these things better. Here, 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 here. <laughs> Okay, I see that Kevin Wensing has conceded his spot, and now this will be our last question because we're in overtime, extra time, whichever way you want to look at it. <laughs> this is a very high-level question, then. Uh, based on the last 70 days of really 
incompetence that we've watched from the Russian army armies. Uh, they don't trust their junior NCOs. Uh, they don't trust their junior officers. And the corruption is rampant. I mean, five days of food gets ordered and three days gets delivered. Uh, and it seems like it crosses over to the Navy. Are the Chinese any better in their planning and control and warfare capabilities than uh, what we're watching on television at the moment? Thank you. I don't know the answer to your question, but as a historian just watches the Chinese in action, and if you look at the statistics on Chinese, on how many of them have died violent deaths over the last 300 years, it's huge. And what, if you look at it, you notice that it's mostly Chinese, like Han Chinese, that's the predominant ethnic group, killing other Han Chinese. And it's not a mark of good strategy if that's what you're doing. And um, it, it, the levels of disorganization, if you think about the Cultural Revolution, I get it a while ago, et cetera. But Xi Jinping is busy closing down the private sector, the people that you all admire and are impressed with the achievements of. It's not the, the, it's not the Communist Party. It's just the regular old citizens who were released and allowed to do things. Well, that's all being closed uh, down now. My understanding that on their Navy ships, they got this mishmash of Soviet parts. They sort of glued together. And now we've watched some of the Soviet stuff in action. I guess you all can analyze it better than I do. And my understanding is their naval stuff isn't that impressive. And uh, China, of course, has bought all this stuff and, and copied it all down and you know, <coughs> memorized it thrice. So um, don't count. I think they probably are incompetent. Uh, why would they trust each other? And um, autocracies have no respect for the young, right? Isn't that what you're seeing in Russia? The corrupt oligarchs do their thing. Who cares about the 18-year-olds the who get drafted? Same thing. That'll be the same in China. But how would a, a, don't assume a cooperative ad, a, a enemy. It's better to chicken little it and the sky is falling. And, and you'll come up with a good strategy. <laughs> okay. <coughs> Tom, 10 feet tall or... Look, I think the, uh, we've, we've gone through two phases of thinking about China as an adversary, and I think we, we're, we're entering the third. So the first was basically ignoring it, dismissing it, um, wishing it away. Then the second phase was <coughs> they're 10 feet tall, they're supermen, they can do anything. And where at the beginning of good strategy is, is this third phase, which is like any other competitor, they've got strengths and they've got weaknesses, just like we've got strengths and weaknesses. What we need to do is figure out how to apply our strengths against their enduring weaknesses, the things that they just can't do anything about because of the nature of their regime, the nature of their society. So hopefully, and again, I, I, would, I would hope the Naval Institute, and I'll trust the Naval Institute to be part of this conversation, we're, we're at a, a mature enough phase of that, of that conversation where we can talk about C, we can talk about China in, uh, in, in public and talk about the other C competition or conflict in polite circles, and we can actually have informed strategic discussions about their strengths, and their, which are considerable, their weaknesses, which are also considerable, our strengths and our weaknesses. Mm -hmm. Secretary Lehman, last word. Well, uh, I, I hate to have a last word that I can't bloviate on, so I just have to agree with Dr. Payne. <laughs> yes. uh, I, I'm, I'm very optimistic. I think we've got the whole cards. And we've got the geography. And uh, uh, we would really have to screw up more than we have ever screwed up to lose those advantages. <laughs> well, I want to thank our panel, uh, Dr. Mankin, Dr. Payne, Secretary Lehman, for an excellent discussion. We've gone a few minutes over, but uh, let's give them all a hand. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
I think right. it's less than $20. I'll tell you. <laughs> oh, no, please, Thanks, don't get me in trouble. Sure. You were Thank terrific. You. Sir, it is Thank such you. an honor to meet you. Well, I love to I get together with that both you've... of you guys. Oh, great yeah, scene. Really, to well, catch up. Role you well, play. just before we all uh, depart the room, oh, well, thank I you. the annual <laughs> meeting, and, uh, and we've got a slide up here, which is a call to action, but I'm often asked by members, you know, Pete, how can I help? And of course, members can help by being engaged, and your very presence here tonight is wonderful, and support us through donations and your membership itself. But I put out a special call to action tonight because members frequently tell me that uh, they have a niece, a nephew, a grandchild, a neighbor, a friend, and often uh, they're people who serve and that were influenced by one of you. And uh, you convinced them to join, to serve. And uh, so I'd just like to put out the challenge tonight that every member get a member. It would help us a lot as we try to refresh and reseed the youth, the vibrancy, the energy uh, for the Naval Institute for the next 149 years. So I ask you to consider that call to action. So thank you all for joining us in person and online this evening. And I want to thank Leonardo DRS for supporting the annual meeting. We strive to provide you, our members, our friends, the best service as we move forward. This concludes the 149th annual meeting. Thank you.